Uh, I want to encourage you to open your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 2. We're going to read again. Julie's going to continue the, the message. Uh, we'll continue the series on lessons in Jeremiah. So we're going to read from uh, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 20 through to verse 5. And then Julie will come up and speak to us about, is it still called the path to restoration, Julie? It's still called the path to restoration. Okay, so... Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 20, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Uh, God is speaking through the prophet Jeremiah. He says, Long ago I broke the yoke that oppressed you and tore away the chains of your slavery. But still you said, I will not serve you. On every hill and under every green tree, you have prostituted yourselves by bowing down to idols. But I was the one who planted you, choosing a vine of the purest stock, the very best. How did you grow into this corrupt wild vine? No amount of soap or lye can make you clean. I still see the stain of your guilt. I, the sovereign Lord, have spoken. You say, that's not true. I haven't worshipped the images of Baal. How can you say that? Says God. Go and look in any valley in the land. Face the awful sins you have done. You're like a restless female camel desperately searching for a mate. You're like a wild donkey sniffing the wind at mating time. Who can restrain her lust? Those who desire her don't need to search for she goes running to them. When will you stop panting after other gods? But you say... Save your breath. I'm in love with these foreign gods and I can't stop loving them now. Israel's like a thief who feels shame only when he gets caught. They, their kings, officials, priests and prophets, all are alike in this. To an image carved from a piece of wood they say, You are my father. To an idol chiseled from a block of stone they say, you are my mother. They turn their backs on me, but in times of trouble, they cry out to me, come and save us. But why not call on these gods you've made? When trouble comes, let them save you if they can. For you have as many gods as there are towns in Judah. Why do you accuse me of doing wrong? You are the ones who have rebelled, says the Lord. I have punished your children, but they did not respond to my discipline. You yourselves have killed your prophets as a lion kills its prey. Oh, my people, listen to the words of the Lord. Have I been like a desert to Israel? Have I been to them a land of darkness? Why then do my people say, at last we're free from God, we don't need him anymore? Does a young woman forget her jewellery? Does a bride hide her wedding dress? Yet for years on end, my people have forgotten me. How you plot and scheme to win your lovers. Even an experienced prostitute could learn from you. Your clothing is stained with the blood of the innocent and the poor, although you didn't catch them breaking into your houses. And yet you say, I've done nothing wrong. Surely God isn't angry with me, but now I will punish you severely because you claim you have not sinned. First here, then there, you flip from one ally to another asking for help, but your new friends in Egypt will let you down, just as Assyria did before. In despair you will be led into exile with your hands on your heads, for the Lord has rejected the nations you trust. They will not help you at all. If a man divorces a woman and she goes and marries someone else, he will not take her back again, for that would surely corrupt the land. But you have prostituted yourselves with many lovers, so why are you trying to come back to me, says the Lord? Look at the shrines on every hilltop. Is there any place you have not been defiled by your adultery with other gods? You sit like a prostitute beside the road waiting for a customer. You sit alone like a nomad in the desert. You have polluted the land with your prostitution and your wickedness. That's why even the spring rains have failed. 
for you are a brazen prostitute and completely shameless. Yet you say to me, Father, you've been my guide since my youth. Surely you won't be angry forever. Surely you can forget about it. So you talk, but you keep on doing all the evil you can. Thank you, Julie. Nico, if we could go straight to slide um, number four, that would be great. Um, this, uh, well, that one will do. That's even better. Um, <laughs> this is the this is the image we used last week in reference to um, God saying, "There's two things. There's two sins you've committed." This is in Jeremiah chapter two. Which verse? Verse 13. You've forsaken me, the spring of living water, and you've dug cisterns for yourself. Can we look at the next one? The picture of the cisterns. No, next one. Behind that one, yeah. There we go. They refuse to come to God for life because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And it said they went to other sources, other means to, to try and bring themselves life. And he says, it's like you've, you've swapped my glory, but I'm a spring of everlasting life. And instead, you prefer to dig cisterns that can be leaking. They collect stuff. They become muddy, stagnant. Algae and bacteria lie on the surface of it. But you would prefer that than to come to me. And that's where we left it, this image um, last week. I'm saying, God saying, this is who I am, the spring. We have that picture again. Let's go back to the spring. It's such a beautiful, this is who I am. This is who I am. It's peaceful. It's full. I'm going to, for sake of time this morning, I'm actually going to jump ahead um, simply to say, and Nico, you can get slide 18 ready, <laughs> simply to say there's a tremendous record in chapter 2. I didn't get to finish it. I was going to finish it off this morning. But it includes you know, things like going to other nations and trying to form alliances with them instead of coming to me, like political alliances. The, the geopolitical scenario in, in the Middle East is such that Israel is surrounded. I mean, look at it now. It's the same. <laughs> They're surrounded. And there was Assyria in the north, a great powerful empire that had taken the 12 tribes, and there was Egypt in the south. And of course, whenever those two collided, who was in the middle? <laughs> Israel in the middle, if you, if you know the geography. And so they're always trying to run to Assyria or run to Egypt and get alliances and bring themselves under the political influence, actually, and the, the spiritual influence of those gods. And God is saying, no, I want you to put your trust in me. I want you to trust me. And I think there are probably people sitting here this morning and you might be relating to that, recognizing that you're running here and you're running there trying to sort out something and God is saying, I wish you'd come to me. I wish you knew me as the spring of living water. I wish you knew me as a covenant-keeping God who, whose faithfulness and love never fail. So what have they done? What have, what's the list of their sins? All comes out in chapter 2. They turned away from God as the spring of living water. They pursued worthless sources of life instead. Anything that will bring me life, doesn't matter. Digging their own cisterns that couldn't hold water. 
They exchange, exchange their glory, God's glory, their God for worthless idols. They refused to serve him. They forgot God and they didn't ask, where is the Lord? They became like a prostitute, giving themselves to many other lovers. They worshipped the false gods in Canaan. And everything that went with that. They persecuted and killed the prophets sent by God to bring correction. They turned to other nations for security and protection instead of to God. And they refused to acknowledge their sin. And this is what God brings against them. And he's the prosecutor and he asks the questions. And he's looking for a response. So really what I want to come to quickly here, um, without going into those verses in detail, I think they are fairly self-explanatory, but chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, that's where I want to land it this morning. These verses, if you, if you look at them in your Bible, they form, they form a kind of a hinge passage because they, they conclude this section, this message um, from God through Jeremiah, it starts with a honeymoon, right? It starts with a honeymoon in the desert. But where is it finishing here? Questions about divorce. So in that way, it, it brings closure to that message. But it also introduces a subject that's going to be the focus of Jeremiah's next message right through you know, right through, well, it comes through the whole book, actually, but especially chapter 3, 4 uh, to 6. And the message, really, in this next chapter that Jeremiah is raising on God's behalf is, what is the definition of repentance? What does it mean to repent? So let's start at verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1. If a man divorces his wife... And she leaves him and marries another man. Should he return to her again? Would not the land be completely defiled? But you have lived as a prostitute with many lovers. Would you now return to me? You may not be aware, but this verse, in this verse, by raising this verse, God is actually quoting the law. He's quoting Deuteronomy 24. And in the law, in Deuteronomy chapter 24, it says that a man was forbidden to take back a wife he had officially divorced, if in the meantime she'd married to another man who had also divorced her. So you got the picture? That's in the law. It's spelt out, very explicit. Um, Derek Kidner, who's an Old Testament uh, scholar, says, this law, and hear the mercy of God in this, hear the love of God in this, this law was aimed against what would amount to virtually lending one's partner to another. For if an authoritarian husband could dismiss his wife and have her back when the next man had finished with her, it would not only degrade her, but marriage itself and the society, any society that accepted such a practice. Therefore, the answer to Jeremiah's question posed in verse 1, should he return to her, is no. No, the law actually expressly forbids it. No, he should not return to her. Walking back through the door of the marital home as if there was no consequence. This is not the definition or expression of repentance. In God's eyes, in his perfect righteousness, such behavior was defiling and detestable to the Lord. Actually, it was dehumanizing. It sounds so strange in the world we live in, the culture we live in, doesn't it? That is how far we have fallen. We're on the same path as Judah. But it actually reveals a lack of understanding and a lack of awe 
regarding the purpose of God's law. Which, what's the purpose of his law? To teach them God's standard of righteousness, yeah? That brings blessing. And therefore, it also shows what is not the righteous standard, right? That's the purpose of the law. Verse 20, he goes on, You've defiled the land with your prostitution and wickedness. Therefore, the showers you have withheld, the showers have been withheld, and no spring rains have fallen, yet you have the brazen look of a prostitute. You refuse to blush with shame. There's not even any blushing going on here. You refuse to repent. So despite the ecological effects, hmm, did you hear that? Despite the ecological effects of their sin, as evidenced by the drought in the land, God has withheld, right? He says that. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, if these and these and these and these things happen, this will be the consequence. We need to put that into our society and kind of look through that lens a little. They refuse. Okay. Despite that, they refuse. They refuse to repent. They refuse to blush. People in such an advanced stage of wickedness who have an over-familiar tone with God it's shocking, isn't it? The fear of you is, the fear of me is not in you, says God. You've just called to me. You've just said, Father, my friend from my youth, will you always be angry? Will your wrath continue forever? As if, as if it's a nothing. They can just come back, right? You know what I mean? Like, like you can just come back, but there's no repentance here. Do you see that? There's no repentance. It's just like, well, God, are you just going to be, you know, like a boring, you know, um, kind of party pooper and just be angry forever? Come on. They're not even blushing with shame. There's no shame. Do you know, one of the roles of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, was to convict the world of sin. And righteousness. That's what we need to be asking him to do. Because there cannot be repentance unless there is that dreadful conviction of sin. That things are not all right like they are. We need that. That is a gift to us. We need it like to pierce right through to the heart and shock us. Because so hard, the hardness of the heart is such that people go, what? No, but that's okay. God's okay with that. And there's no fear. There's no awe of him. We've sung songs of worship this morning. But I want to challenge you. that we need a spirit of the fear of the Lord. We need it. We are thirsty for it. We must be thirsty for it. And God says, you say all these things, and then you just carry on doing all this stuff. It just doesn't matter. To understand better the height from which Judah has fallen and the present hardness of Judah's heart. Now, God's been watching this, right? And he's been sending his prophets to correct them. Well, half of them they killed, you know, and the others they persecuted terribly. But to understand this present hardness of their heart, let's turn to the record of Manasseh's reign. Now, I mentioned Manasseh last week. He is notoriously well-known, if, if, you, if you read the Bible, he was like what? He was the longest, I think the longest reigning wicked king <laughs> of, of, of Judah. He had a long reign and he was su supremely evil, honestly. I'm just, you don't need to go here, but I want to tell you, go later. I want you to listen right now. Second Chronicles 33, go later and read it. 
Manasseh was how old? Do you, any of you remember how old when he became king? 12. He was 12 when he became king. How about that? Any 12-year-olds here? Don't get any ideas. And he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He, here we go, he rebuilt the high places that his father Hezekiah had demolished. Remember that? He also erected altars to the Baals and made Asherah poles. He bowed down to all the starry hosts and worshipped them. He built altars in the temple of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, My name will remain in Jerusalem forever. Did you catch that? He built altars in Solomon's temple. In both courts of the temple of the Lord, it says. He built altars to all the starry hosts. He sacrificed his children in the fire, most likely to Moloch, the Canaanite god, in the valley of Ben-Hinnom. He practiced divination and witchcraft, and he sought omens. He consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil. I'm sure this isn't even the full list. In the eyes of the Lord. Arousing his anger, he took the image he had made and put it in God's temple. A couple of verses later, it says, Manasseh led Judah and the people of Jerusalem astray so that they did more evil than the nations the Lord had destroyed before the Israelites. These are stunning statements of his wickedness. And this is where Judah's at. Josiah is Manasseh's grandson. Right? So Josiah, this is around the time, okay, Jeremiah begins preaching. Josiah brings a reform. Awesome. But you know what it says in the scripture? It says, it says in chapter 2 and then it repeats it in chapter 3. But your returning to me was just a pretense. It wasn't repentance. It looked like something good. It was just fake. And you know, after Josiah was killed in the battle against Pharaoh of Necho, 609 BC, three months it took. And they were back to everything they'd been doing before. Completely turned like that. Three months. That tells us God's not making this up. I mean, God knows the heart anyway, right? It was a pretense. That's what God calls it. It was a pretense. You just took on a form. You made it look sanitized. But you're not cleansed. You didn't turn. I want to ask you, so this is where Judah's at. Judah's hardness of heart has her in a hopeless predicament, wouldn't you say? They're not even listening to God. Disaster is on the doorstep and they're not listening. Do you remember those times when your parents, your mum usually, said to you, don't do that or this is going to happen? And you went, mm-hmm. And you did it. And it happened. This is that. She's unteachable. Unable to be corrected. Let me ask you a question. Could she ever return to the Lord? Now you guys know what happened after this and this and that and whatever. But, but according to the law, right? The law has said no. Not at all. God's confirmed that. But the question is, will God take her back? Will he take the initiative? Is God bound, oh, this is a good one, is God bound by his own law? Is God bound by his own law? 
can see you're thinking about that one. We have yeas and nays. Yes? No. I'm not voting. <laughs> we'll come back to that in a minute. The rest of chapter 3, which we didn't read this morning, is fragrant with hope. God tells Jeremiah to go and proclaim this message toward the north where Israel has already been exiled. If you want to just look ahead for a second, we're just going to look at a couple of verses. Chapter 3, verse 12. This is the message, he says, proclaim it towards the north. Now remember what's in the north? Assyria. Where, who's gone there? Ten northern tribes, okay? They've already, hundred years ago, hundred years earlier, they've gone. They've gone. God let them, you know, he let them go. They got there sooner than Judah. But actually he, can, he condemns Judah because she saw all that happened and she didn't change. <laughs> So she's worse in God's eyes. So now he's saying, Jeremiah, go and proclaim to the north this message. And it's interesting because Judah and Israel, uh, uh, the the metaphor is of sisters, two sisters, right? And I was just thinking about this in a family context, you know, like when one child perhaps isn't doing the right thing and God, uh, you know, dad, rather, dad or mum will say, um, uh, talk to the other, uh, will start talking to the other one and say, well, you can have this opportunity. The other one's listening. It feels a bit like that to me, almost. Like God is now speaking to the ones who've been exiled for a hundred years through Jeremiah. This is being written down, like it will be, not right at this moment, but it will be written down. We're reading it because it was written down. It goes into exile with them. And even though we know Judah didn't repent... They didn't turn in their hearts. So the discipline had to come. God's word follows them into exile. And now they have perhaps a little more motivation to listen to God. A little bit more interest in what God had to say in this message when he was talking to faithless Israel. This is what he said, return. Faithless Israel declares the Lord, I will frown on you no longer for I am faithful. I will not be angry forever. Oh, there's the answer. Will you be angry forever? Remember that? I will not be angry forever. Here's the kicker. Only acknowledge your guilt. You have rebelled against the Lord your God. You have scattered your favors to foreign gods under every spreading tree and have not obeyed me, declares the Lord. Chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. This is the other one. O Israel, says the Lord, if you wanted to return to me, you could. You could throw away your detestable idols and stray away no more. Then when you swear by my names, saying, as surely as the Lord lives, you could do so with truth, justice, and righteousness. And then you would be a blessing to the nations of the world. And all people would come and praise my name. And there's the covenant. There's the covenant coming in. You were called, you were destined to be a blessing. I called you to make you a blessing in your seed, right? The nations of the world, what a promise, a blessing to the nations. But there has to be true repentance. There has to be repentance because repentance leads to transformation. But it's costly. I wonder if you've ever thought about the discipline of the Lord or things that have happened in your life and thought to yourself, boy, that was costly. But that shook me to the core. And sadly, probably it was necessary. God apprehended me. Because repentance is not just a word. It's not 
a rote sentence saying, God, please forgive me. It can be. But repentance brings real transformation. Psalm 119, it's a great psalm. Verse 67. Before I was afflicted, he says, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I obey your word. What about Job? Elihu says to Job, those who suffer, he delivers in their suffering. He speaks to them in their affliction. He is wooing you, Job, from the jaws of distress to a spacious place, free from restriction. That's a perspective on the discipline of the Lord that we need to have and to hold and to cherish. You see, when we've gone through the stages of repentance, That's what leads to the worship that we were talking about this morning, that Nathan was talking about. Because now I've seen the Lord. And that's what, that's what Job said, didn't he? Elihu upheld the greatness of God, his absolute worthiness. And then God speaks to Job out of the storm through, yeah, and says, brace yourself like a man because you've got some, you got some ans- I, I've got some questions and I want you to answer them. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Were you there, Job? Job listens and he's been hit with reality and his own sinfulness for the first time. And what's his response? Before my ears had heard of you, ah, oh, yeah, I knew, I knew the right things to do. I had a knowledge of you, but now my eyes have seen you. And what's his response? I repent in dust and ashes. That's what the Lord is calling us to. Not some flippant thing that doesn't cost us anything. If the Lord is going to have a bride that is worthy of him, then we are going to experience the cost to God of making that possible. What's that? Back to Manasseh, 2 Chronicles 33. Manasseh gets a big serve, doesn't he? Man, he should too, right? What he's lesser known for is what I'm about to read to you. Same chapter, verse 10. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they paid no attention. So the Lord brought against them the army commanders of the king of Assyria who took Manasseh prisoner, put a hook in his nose, bound him with bronze shackles and took him to Babylon. In his distress, he sought the favor of the Lord his God. Now you say, why Babylon? Well, Babylon was actually under Assyria at that time. They then conquer Assyria as they grow. In his distress, he sought the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his ancestors. And when he prayed to him, the Lord was moved by his entreaty and listened to his plea. So he brought him back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. And then Manasseh knew that the Lord is God. Here's the repentance. 
Afterward, he rebuilt the outer wall of the city of David, west of the Gihon Spring in the valley. As far as the entrance of the fish gate, encircling the hill of Ophel, he also made it much higher. He stationed military commanders in all the fortified cities in Judah. He got rid of the foreign gods and removed the image from the temple of the Lord, as well as all the altars he had built on the temple hill and in Jerusalem, and he threw them out of the city. Then he restored the altar of the Lord and sacrificed fellowship offerings and thank offerings on it and told Judah to serve the Lord, the God of Israel. Did you know that about Manasseh? Isn't that awesome? Why is it so awesome? Because he was so wicked. (laughs) Isn't that right? I want to ask you a couple of questions. Can Manasseh's repentance make him right with God? Can anything we do make us right with God? What about this one? What was the cost to God of bringing Manasseh back to himself? Was it enough that Manasseh repented and did all that stuff at, that which was the fruit of repentance? Was that, was that enough? I want you to look at this next scripture. Romans 3, 23 to 26. This is Paul. Rabbi Paul, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Was Manasseh's action alone enough to satisfy the righteousness of God? Tell me. No. But it was because why? Did he know Jesus? Well, not that we know of. Maybe he had a vision. But listen to this. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at that present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Do you understand what that's saying? Someone is, they went, wow. That is saying that God accepted Manasseh's repentance and he credited it to him as righteousness. Sounds like Abraham. Sounds like David. Sounds like umpteen people. And the reason he did that, well, this is the mystery of God, isn't it? He doesn't have to explain himself. The reason he did it was because the Lamb of God, who was slain before the foundations of the earth, was the one faithful Israelite who could be counted on at that moment in history, that moment, 4,000 years since the beginning, that moment, he was going to shed royal blood on the cross. And God believed him. They had a covenant. And because of that, in his forbearance, he could receive the repentance, the sincerity of their faith. Because it was replied, it was applied retrospectively, presently, and future. Do you get it? Isn't that a spin out? (laughs) none of us have ever been able to do anything that could earn us salvation. 
could earn us right standing with God. Do you realize that? And someone as messed up as Manasseh could experience God in his distress. And you can read, you can read other literature that will tell you a little bit about some of his distress in Babylon. Turn his heart. Not just like, God forgive me, I messed up. And then go back because God let him go. There, there. It's okay. Because, you know, I love you so much. No. God was looking for repentance. And before Manasseh returned, <laughs> before he could prove all of that, God released him to go back and walk out the fruit of repentance. We have an amazing God, don't we? You see, it cost God... We take this for granted, don't we? We take what we have for granted. And in fact, we think he owes us more. Yeah? Listen to the grumbling and the complaining that comes out of your mouth. You'll get it. And yet it cost God. It cost him. It cost him. I have nothing except that he gave his son. Because only the son of, only the unpay the price, right? There was only one person. It says in Revelation 5, only one person was found worthy. And God gave him up. And Jesus laid aside his deity. He laid it aside. He took on a human form. That's what it says, Philippians 2. He clothed himself in humanity. He said yes to his father. And he became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Crucifixion. Why did it have to be crucifixion? The worst torture tool in the Roman army's cabinet. died he was buried and on the third day God resurrected him and raised him to the highest place that your name son it's the name above every other name by which men and women and children can be saved and I want to say it's not Unfortunately, many times I have encountered people who have come to Christ and received repent, uh, like forgiveness and claimed, you know, claimed it sincerely, claimed it all and turned their lives around, but they live chained by their past. They live in the worthlessness and the despair, which I'm going to say it, I'm just going to say what it is, when we are looking to ourselves to save ourselves. It's called self-righteousness. But it doesn't often look like that. It looks like humility or I'm so bad. And God calls it pride. He says, I dealt with it. I dealt with it. That's all I can do. That's all I can do. And if you want to keep blaming yourself, I'm not, I'm not going to send Jesus to die again. You have to deal with that. You have to come to the foot of the cross and you have to crucify your pride and your self-righteousness and your sense of unworthiness or you will never have the life I've promised you. Only acknowledge your guilt. Return to the Lord. Turn to him for forgiveness, cleansing, and eternal life. Do you know what? It never depended on me. 
so nothing can ever separate me from his love. Right? It never depended on me. Jesus is the spring of living water. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he wants our repentance today. Let's stand together. The worship team are just going to play and Wayne's going to lead us in the feast of Jesus. This is a moment. If the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you, even if he's just been correcting thoughts that are not worthy of Jesus, tell him, Lord, cleanse me of that. Set me free to worship you. I want to see you.